Hey there, my name is Alex, I am the Silvermont, and this is a starter guide for Dark Souls. Designed for those of you who are just getting into the game, after all it's never too late. I'm not going to spoil the game for you or tell you where to find the best weapons, instead we're going to treat this like an extension of the game's manual. We'll cover some subjects that you need to know, but might not be immediately obvious from the outset. Now generally speaking, you will get the best experience out of Dark Souls if you go in blind, so to speak. This is a game that rewards exploration and punishes those who are not prepared. That out of the way, let's get started. There are some mechanics in Dark Souls that do need explaining, and that's what we're going to start with. Primarily, Dark Souls is what you could call a real-time action RPG. Your survival is dependent on both your skill and your stats. But don't worry if you don't have amazing reactions or anything like that. You don't really need them. Your health meter is quite self-explanatory. When this reaches zero, you die. You can increase your total health by increasing the vitality stat. And the other meter on screen is equally as important, the green stamina bar. Almost all of your actions in Dark Souls will deplete this in some way, attacking, rolling, running, and so forth. Proper management of this is key. If you are attacking an enemy, always leave yourself just enough stamina to escape. If the bar depletes, you will be unable to attack or roll until it has recovered. You can increase your total stamina by raising the endurance stat, and you'll also find items here and there that may increase the speed of which stamina regenerates. So far, so good. But this is where it gets a little more complicated. There is another very important mechanic in Dark Souls that isn't explained all too well by the game. Poise. Put simply, poise is your ability to receive attacks and not flinch. The higher your poise, the more attacks you can take. It may help to visualise poise as an invisible third bar beneath your stamina. The length of this bar is determined by your poise stat. Heavy armour will generally have more poise, and every time you receive an attack, the poise bar will deplete, just as your stamina bar depletes when you block enemy attacks. And when your poise is broken and the bar depleted, your character will flinch or stagger. Unlike health and stamina, poise is almost entirely a statistic tied to your equipment. You can increase it by finding armour with more poise on, and there are certain rings that increase it, and even some magic spells may boost it. Quite often you will find yourself trying to find a nice balance between poise and equip burden. And what is equip burden? Quite simply, every item you equip on your character adds to your equip burden, how much you are carrying, essentially. You can have an unlimited number of items in your inventory and not have to worry about their weight, but as soon as you equip that nice new sword, you have to keep an eye on the weight and how it impacts your equip burden. You can increase your maximum equip burden by raising the endurance stat. There are also various breakpoints to keep in mind. If your current equip burden is less than 25% of your maximum, then you will be fast. You will roll fast and move fast. If it is between 25 and 50% of your maximum, you'll be in the medium class. And then once you go over 50% of your maximum, you'll be in the slow category. The dodge rolls will be very slow and cumbersome. And if you exceed 100%, you will no longer be able to roll and your movement speed will be reduced to a walk. So let's say you have 100 equip burden maximum, and with all your armour and weapons equipped, you are at 26 out of 100. That's 26%, and just enough to push you into medium speed. In situations like these, you may want to consider swapping out or unequipping some equipment just to take you down a little bit so that you can fast roll. Outside of your equip burden exceeding 100% however, you'll find that all movement speeds are viable in their own ways. Experiment with what works best for you. As a general rule of thumb, slower characters will have higher physical defence and poise, but find it harder to avoid attacks. But you can of course, if you wish, maximise your efficiency to have a fast movement speed and high poise, if that's your thing. Another important stat is stability. This is the stat of choice for all shields. Every shield in the game has a stability factor you can find, and the higher, the better. Whilst you'll generally want a shield that blocks 100% physical damage, you'll also want a shield with high stability. 
What does this mean? Essentially, every time you block an attack, it will drain some of your stamina. The higher your stability, the less stamina it will drain. There are certain shields in the game with such high stability, you will be able to continuously block almost anything thrown at you. Assuming, of course, you have the strength to wield that shield. The other stats you have to play around with are fairly straightforward. Strength and Dexterity are your main melee damage statistics. Almost every weapon you find will scale with either Strength, Dexterity, or both. Clubs, hammers, large weapons, those will typically be your Strength weapons, whereas Spears, Rapiers, lighter weapons generally fall under Dexterity. You'll probably notice that most weapons have letters in their descriptions somewhere too. Let's take the longsword for example. The two C's mean that this weapon scales equally with both strength and dexterity, and it works from an E to S scale. So if your weapon has an A with strength, but only an E in dex, that means you will receive bonus damage from your strength stat. The higher your strength, the higher the bonus, whereas the bonus from dex will be low as it's only E. Weapons and damage will also scale from the two magic stats, faith and intelligence, occasionally. And speaking of magic, once you have found a spell, you will need to attune it to your character in order to actually use it. First up, you will need a catalyst with which to cast the spell. Certain characters start with these, but they're never too hard to find. Faith catalysts cannot be used to cast sorcery, and sorcery catalysts cannot be used to cast miracles, generally speaking, although there are some exceptions. Miracles are usually dependent on your faith stat and sorcery on your intelligence stat. Once you've equipped the catalyst as you would any other weapon, you then need to equip the actual spell, and you can attune numerous spells to your character, assuming you have high enough attunement. The more points into attunement you put, the more spell slots or attunement slots you will have. Equipping or attuning these spells is done at any bonfire, and likewise when you rest at a bonfire, your spells will be replenished automatically. So in essence, equip the catalyst in your left or right hand, and then equip your spell at choice at the bonfire, and then you're good to go. Finally, we have the humanity and online mechanics. This can be confusing at first, but you'll quickly get the hang of it. There are essentially two modes in Dark Souls, Human Mode and Hollow Mode. It's easy to tell which you're currently in, just have a look at your character. If they resemble a human, you're in Human Mode, even if your character is very ugly. Whereas if you resemble a sausage, you're Hollow. In Human Mode, you can summon other players to assist you, you can be invaded by other players who will seek to kill you, and you can also place down your own summoning sign for other players to call you into their world. Whereas when you are hollow, you cannot summon other players, nor can you be invaded. You can, however, place your own sign down to allow others to summon you. Whenever you are in human mode and you die, you will enter hollow mode, outside of a few exceptional situations. If you die again in hollow mode, you will remain in hollow mode. Likewise, when you die, your corpse will transform into a blood pool, a glowing green mass around where you died. So if you fall off a ledge, don't worry, it won't be down where you fell, it will usually be at the top somewhere. This glowing green mass contains all of the souls and humanity you had on you at time of death. You can return and obtain these souls, but if you die again whilst making your way there, you will lose them permanently. Take this into consideration. Have you just defeated a boss or otherwise have obtained a large amount of souls? Instead of pushing on to the next area, perhaps you should fall back and spend those souls. Even if you don't have enough souls to level up your character, there is always something you can invest your souls into, whether it's upgrading your equipment or even just purchasing items. Items will remain on your character permanently, unless you choose to be rid of them or use them. Sometimes it's even worth it to suicide run to obtain an item, as you will retain it after death, just not your souls and your humanity. Those will of course be dropped when you die, though you do, as mentioned, have one chance to go and pick them up. But remember, death isn't the be-all and end-all in Dark Souls. Prepare to die is not a warning, it is advice. Always be prepared for it. If you're holding on to a huge amount of souls and pushing into new dangerous territory, be prepared to lose them. 
and consider spending them beforehand, even if you consider it a waste to buy some arrows or firebombs or anything like that, in the end it's going to do you more good than if you lose those souls entirely, and you might end up kicking yourself if you think I'm just going to hold on to these souls for a bit more and then you die and lose them. That will probably happen to you at least once. But even if you do lose a huge amount of souls, and we've all been there, don't despair. Souls are infinite and there will always be more souls to obtain. Humanity on the other hand can be harder to come by. When you pick up humanity, it will be stored in your inventory as an item, and if you use that item you will heal to full. You can think of that as hard humanity. Using hard humanity will also grant you soft humanity, the number next to your health and stamina. Soft humanity is dropped upon death, whereas hard humanity, the item, is retained. However, soft humanity also grants you a number of benefits. It can be used to kindle bonfires. It can be used to return to your human form at a bonfire. Soft humanity will also slightly increase your overall defense, and it even has other uses you will no doubt discover. As with other things, you will have to balance soft humanity and hard humanity. Moving on to online functionality. There are three basic modes of online play, summoning other players to assist you, being summoned by other players to assist them, and invasions. When you are in human form you can summon two phantoms to aid you. It can be two real players, one real player and an NPC phantom, or two NPC phantoms. Whether they are other players or AI controlled characters, they will be unable to heal using their own esters, so you'll want to keep an eye on their health. Using your own esters will heal them slightly. They will also remain with you until you die, or they die, or you defeat the area boss, at which point they will return to their own world. Whereas if you are summoned by another player, many of the same rules apply. If you die in their world, you will return to their own, but you don't need to worry about losing your souls or humanity. Whilst you cannot heal with Estus, you can use hard humanity, the humanity items, or healing miracles. If you plan to do a lot of cooperative play, you might want to consider obtaining some basic healing miracles. If you successfully aid another player in defeating a boss, not only will you receive a tidy amount of souls, but you'll also receive some soft humanity, meaning that you can return to human form if you were in hollow. And remember, once you have defeated an area boss, you typically cannot summon or be invaded in that area, but you can still allow others to summon you. So are you stuck on a boss? Consider allowing some other players to summon you. That way you can fight the boss in a safer environment, giving you a chance to study the boss, and even how other players might approach it. See another player using a cool weapon that seems really effective against the boss? Maybe ask them where they got it, or how they were doing so effectively. Dark Souls is a very community driven game. Whilst you cannot directly communicate with other players most of the time, it's almost always fairly easy to send them a message after your session. And it's of mutual benefit to everyone to help out, so don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. Many players are happy to do so. That said, invasions do exist. If a player invades your world, you must assume they are there for one thing and one thing only, to destroy you. Of course, that isn't always the case, sometimes you may even come across benevolent invaders. But do not assume that, never assume that, always assume the worst in this case. They are there to destroy you. If an invader kills the host of that world, they will receive humanity and some souls. The same is true if the host kills the invader. Of course, you may run into invaders who are there to play around with you, maybe to drop you items, or perhaps even want an honourable duel, but remember, they are the ones who force themselves into your world. And sometimes it is better not to pick up items dropped by other players, as there is always a chance those items will be modded or hacked, and will have a negative influence on your experience. Of course, you may sometimes see red summon signs, these are used to actively summon a hostile player. Think of it as an honourable way to invade. You have invited them into your world to fight you to the death. And sometimes you might run into someone who your weapons just bounce off doing no damage. If you are low level, it's not too uncommon to come across other players who have maximised their own equipment despite remaining at a low level.
and upgrading your equipment in Dark Souls is very important. You can turn your longsword into a longsword plus one and it will receive a bonus to damage and then you can take it up to plus two, plus three and so on all the way up to plus fifteen. Some weapons will only reach a maximum level of plus five and you may need certain items to take them past a certain level. For example, the blacksmith initially can take your weapons to plus 5, but if you want to go from plus 6 to plus 10, you may need an item, which you will have to find in the world. Armor can be taken up to a maximum of plus 10, and if the choice is between upgrading your weapon or increasing one of your stats with which you wield said weapon, most of the time you will receive more benefit from upgrading the weapon first. But that said, there are many weapons in Dark Souls and almost all of them are perfectly viable. If you like the weapon your character started out with, don't be afraid to upgrade it. You aren't necessarily going to find better weapons later in the game, just different ones. And at plus 15, almost all of the weapons are good, and most of the starting weapons are very good. The basic longsword that I've been using as an example is a starting weapon, and I would say it's one of the best all-around weapons in the game, as it happens. But when it comes to upgrading, if you upgrade your stats, that will of course help you for pretty much every weapon, whereas upgrading a singular weapon will grant you a larger benefit, but only for that weapon. Anyway, I think that about covers it for mechanics, so let's move on to an important choice, but perhaps one not as important as you would think. There are 10 classes in Dark Souls that cover a wide variety of backgrounds, and that's precisely what they are. Classes in Dark Souls are more of a role-playing thing than an absolute gameplay variable. Every class will be able to use every weapon, spell, and ability in the game. There is nothing to prevent you from picking the light-armoured, axe-wielding bandit and ending up as a miracle-wielding hammer-and-steel paladin. The main thing to consider here is that every class starts with a unique gear and different stats. But even then, you will be able to find every class item throughout the game. You might start as a warrior, but you'll find the thief starting equipment. So if one class visually appeals to you, but another class statistically appeals to you, don't worry about that. I actually have a very in-depth video on classes that you can find here, or linked in the video description. But for the most part, pick whichever appeals to you the most. In my opinion, the best beginner classes would be the Knight and Pyromancer. The Knight starts with the highest poise and defense values and a decent weapon, whereas the Pyromancer starts at the lowest level, which isn't actually a bad thing, it allows you to craft your character as you see fit. They also start with a decent weapon, and they start with fairly nice magic to boot. The hardest starting characters would be, again purely in my opinion, the Bandit and Sorcerer. To say nothing of the Deprived, of course. Another great choice is always the Warrior. He might not have much poise, but he has high strength and dex, a great shield and great weapon. These high-ish starting stats will allow you to try out a good deal of weapons, which is probably what you're going to want to do on your first playthrough, try as many as possible. But in the end, there is no right or wrong choice, they are all good in their own ways. It should be noted of course that the Thief is unique in that they start with the Master Key item, which is usually a starting gift, which means that the Thief can essentially start with a free starting gift. As for which gift you should take, that is again up to you. All of these can be obtained in the game at some point, so don't worry about using them up right away. That said, the Master Key is a permanent and very useful item, and it's what I take 9 out of 10 times. But let's move on to the final section. There are dozens and dozens of weapons in Dark Souls, and don't be afraid to try them out. Likewise, don't worry too much about whether or not a weapon is good or bad. Find something that works for you. Keep in mind, the stats that a weapon will scale with, and remember to upgrade it whenever you have the chance. If you feel like your weapon isn't doing enough damage, stop and consider. When was the last time I upgraded it? Or perhaps have a look. Are you using a sword that scales with dexterity, but your dexterity stat is very low? That could explain it. You will also find various status inflicting weapons. Most of these are self-explanatory, but one that the game doesn't make abundantly clear is the bleed status. 
Now and then you might see it pop up on the screen, bleeding or poisoned and so forth. These are the aforementioned status effects. They build up with a bar. Poison reduces your health over time. That's pretty simple. Bleeding is also fairly simple once you get the hang of it. Every time a weapon with bleed hits you, you will notice that a bar or meter is building up. When that meter fills, you will bleed. This essentially tears away a chunk of your life instantly, usually somewhere between 30 and 50%. You can increase your resistance to bleeding through various items, as you can with almost all other status effects. Fortunately, the most dangerous status effect, the curse, is rarely encountered, and players are unable to inflict it upon other players in usual gameplay, so if another player curses you, you can probably put it down to them hacking. But if you see a meter beginning to build up on your screen, try your best to avoid it. Take a few steps back, get out of the poison pool, stop letting them hit you, and so forth. Because most of the time status effects are pretty nasty. Along with status effects, weapons can also inflict elemental damage, fire, lightning, and so forth. If you see a fire longsword or a lightning spear, that means that the weapon's damage will be split between the physical damage and the lightning damage, or the fire damage, and so forth. Elemental weapons can be very powerful and very attractive in the early game, but keep in mind that they almost always will remove stat scaling from the weapon entirely. This means that the weapon will not benefit from your stats, so at higher levels it's probably better to stick with physical damage weapons unless they have very low scaling on them. You'll find a number of different upgrade paths you can apply to your weapon throughout the game, and some might have interesting benefits, such as holy weapons keeping those pesky skeletons from reviving. Once again, they are almost all useful in their own ways, so to play around, see what works for you. And that about sums it up. Of course, don't worry if parts of this video were confusing to you. In the end, the best way to improve is simply to play. So hop into Lordran, pitch yourself against some hollows, and if you have any questions or tips to share of your own, leave them down in the comments section. Oh, and one last thing. If you've heard of the Drake Sword, don't believe the hype. It is a crutch that you shouldn't depend on, and it will do you more harm than good in the long run. Until next time, you take care.